Amen? That's right. I thought you were going to go with it. I was going to sit back down. Amen? This is the Lord's Word. It ain't, you know, right? That's what we do. Um, I'm kind of impressed. Last time I ministered here a few weeks ago, I couldn't turn the mic on. I've been working on my flexibility a little bit and uh, walking away, stretching, all that. Uh, seriously, I ain't kidding about that. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you know, I was talking to Jay a while ago, and, uh, you know, God, is there's something going on right now. And uh, I know that we, we hear that on a regular basis from people, but, you know, uh, it's not real popular to be a bulldozer. And uh, since uh, Rick brought up some things about some pruning and knocking down and uh, fixing up and all that, and it, it made me start thinking about mine and Jay's conversation. You know, for years, um, you know, it seems like you repelled more people than you drew in. And uh, you've got to do what God has called you to do. But uh, being a bulldozer is like a piece of sandpaper and a, a sensitive area on your body. And I'm talking about the ministry. And we can't be somebody else. Could you imagine, you know, Jeremiah wanting to be something else? You know, he had a message to proclaim. And uh, so when I minister this, this message, uh, just understand uh, we're going to be talking about blindness. We're going to be talking about bench pressing. We're going to be talking about hardness of heart. But just understand that this is God's Word. And uh, I never put myself in a position above the others. And I, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of people. And I know for years that I used to have to kick doors in. Well, my kicker don't work so good anymore. So uh, now I find the doors opening when I walk by. And we're in that season right now. We're in that season to where we've knocked some things down and we cleared some terrain and uh, we've thrown some rocks out and we've prepared the field. But we're in a season now to where God is sending a harvest. And we're seeing that. So in the darkest days, the light is easily seen. I always remember that. And we're in that day. Don't try to be what somebody else said you were. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, all this stuff and this junk. Just give the old beller of a sheep and go on with what God has told you to do. I can't be somebody else. I was telling my wife the other day, I uh, was headed to the district track meet, and I said, I'm as introverted as they come. I know some of you might not believe that, but, you know, I, that just basically means I'm not going to kiss everybody's baby. I'm not going to hug everybody that walks by. I'm not even going to say hello to everybody. That's, me and Kevin are different in that area. We have some very strong similarities, but in that area, we're different. That's his gift. Mine is different. And the only reason why I'm telling you that is because who are you? Sometimes we spend time in the body of Christ trying to be what somebody else told us we're supposed to be. You know, that personality that God gave you is just like me and Kevin talking. Uh, this was 21 years ago when we got saved. And we were both under conviction because we didn't think, how in the world can I be who I am and preach the gospel? I didn't think that I could coach high school football and be a Christian because I'd never seen one. And the Lord said, and, and, and he spoke this to me, and I don't know how he spoke it. He just downloaded it inside of me. He said, the personality you have is the personality I gave you. You glorified my enemy, now glorify me. So in other words, Kevin, and this is the conversation we had, was if you were a loud mouth, bar hopping, fighting drunk, you're probably going to be a loud mouth, devil fighting, tongue talking, filled up from the floor up, Holy Ghost Christian. That's your personality. That's a gift from God. Even, and I don't want to get into secular stuff. You, you'd be surprised how much secular stuff does align with the Word of God, but they're just in complete rebellion to it, so they try to add little things to try to, they try to take God out of it, okay? And I'm not saying everything, but in some things. And this morning, uh, we did a message, we used to do a message, a message on Sunday morning about 9 o'clock, and uh, since Kevin had texted me about an hour, uh, I guess about 8.30 this morning, and you know, asked if we could do this, and of course, we're always ready, then, uh, so we did a short message, and I want to share some of that with you this morning, and we'll just see where the Lord's going to take this to, and if I had to give this message today a, um, a name, I do this. Remember, I'm in the classroom. I'm telling you. I do this with my kids. I, I carry around a little journal, okay, and what I do is, is when I pray in the morning and I read the Word, I have this with me for the things that God impresses upon me that need to be written down according to the Scripture. Let me say that again, according to the Scripture, because I have a lot of crazy things that come upon me that are not of God, all right? And I war against those things, all right? Just like I war against my desire when I get up in the morning to go work out, right, Kevin? 
<laughs> we have to war against some things in order to maintain. We're dying, but we're not going to help the process, right? We're trying to slow it down. It's the same way in the spiritual, but in these notes, the things I wrote down, I wrote hardness of heart. And I believe this all ties into to bench pressing. I believe it ties into spiritual blindness. And I'm going to share a few things with you as I have time that will make you think about it a little bit. First of all, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, and in verse 8, it says, For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life that now is and that which is to come. I'm reminded as I say that of, of a word that my son received, Derek, right over here, many years ago as he was headed to work out one morning. And, and, and God, God had told him, according to Ephesians 4.30, if I remember correctly, he said, don't grieve my Holy Spirit. And when he got to the workout, he went ahead because he was committed to the workout. And to some way, however it was said, the Lord told him, said, look, they're all building perishing temples. And that's what we see. That's what we see. It's foolishness to exercise this body. It, it, it's foolishness to take care of these eyes, whether it be through glasses or, or, or going to your optometrist and all of those things or your prescription, whatever it is. It's foolishness and to ignore what's eternal. See, the part of you that's eternal we can't see. And many of you see way too well in the world, Samson. You see, Samson had to be blinded before he could see. Do you remember what happened? You remember he had a lust for women? And you remember he went into Delilah and remember that, that she continued to poke at him and poke at him till he gave the secret of his power, his strength that was from God, and as he fell asleep, could you imagine? That's about how intoxicating that spirit is. That's how intoxicating it is to think that I want a better bench press, but I have no plan for eternal life. So this bodily exercise profits little. But godliness profits eternally. Turn back with me to John 16, and I want to read to you the verse in 33. It says, The things I've spoken to you, that in you you may have peace, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Now tribulation, uh, the word for tribulation is thalipsis. And it's pressure, oppression, stress, anguish, tribulation, adversity, affliction, crushing, squashing, squeezing, distress. It, it, it would be putting pressure, and I'm just going to get, go ahead and get to it. It's crushing olives or grapes. The reason why that we bench press, the reason why that we go do the body workout we do is to create an injury in the muscle that in the repair it will grow back stronger and harder than what it was. See, the reason why you face tribulation is to become stronger in the Spirit, to be strong. The reason why you will have tribulation, you will have pressing, you will have trials. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, 46, it says, first the natural, speaking of the first man, Adam, then second, the spiritual, speaking of Yeshua, the Christ. You see, you've got to decide in the natural and what I see many times is there's many times that we're willing to stay in the natural and keep deciding for the natural, but we won't walk to the Spirit. And yet at the same time, I contradict myself, I see many that won't even take care of what's natural. We have a nation that is the most unhealthy nation in the world with the most riches in medicine and science there is. We have a nation that is completely lost that there's more Bibles free of charge that you can get, more church buildings, more preachers, some of them self-proclaimed, than anywhere else in the world. Those are things that I think about, things that I chew on. Spiritual bench pressing, pressure. It was James 4, 7. I'm just speaking as the God gives me, God gives me the word. He says, submit to God. I said, submit to God. You've got to submit. In order to submit, you've got to walk. James says, faith without works is dead. I've got to make a move. There's so many times I can remember starting out in my faith walk that I thought that, you know what, I'm born again and saved, and God's just going to wave his hand over me and just do everything. But as I've matured, I'm not a baby anymore. I'm at least 21. 
because it's been 21 years since I repented. I need to stop acting like a baby. I need to stop acting like a child. And I don't need, mean to be nasty or anything like that, but there's too many people that claim to be saved that are still breastfeeding. There's too many people that have been saved, according to Paul addressing the church of Corinth, that are still sucking on the milk bottle. They still had not cut teeth to get into the meat of the Word. They have no understanding of things. Jesus did not come to give you peace with the world. He came to give you peace with God. For the wrath of God was taken out upon Jesus, the Christ, that it would not have to be taken out upon you. And woe to him who rejects that sacrifice of God. What are you saved from? I ask people this all the time. Well, I'm saved from hell. I said, do you do? Oh, you'd rather go to hell. And I know it's a little bit of a play on words there. I understand that. The wrath of God is serious. You have no fear of God the way you live your life. Yeah, I'm a bulldozer. I can't try to be a backhoe or a, you know, a little garden tractor or whatever. That's what I am. That's what God called me to be. Because I don't kiss you on the forehead when you walk by. I don't mean I don't love you and I don't care about you. I've got to speak what God has given me. And sometimes I feel exactly like Jeremiah, exactly like him. Not that I'm qualified to be him. I'm nobody. I'm qualified to be dung. I'm qualified to be in hell. That's what I am. But the point of the matter is, is he preached the gospel of repentance, and there's no evidence of any repentance taking place. He preached the gospel with stones being thrown at him. He preached the gospel as they put him in a well. He preached the gospel as they, as they cursed him and called him all manner of names. He preached the gospel, and he's commanded that he couldn't have a companion. He couldn't have a wife. That would preach, but I'm not going to go there right now. When he said, I'll just stop. Come on, man. You, you relate. I know I do. It's just time to say, okay, Lord. <laughs> it's Monday. I'm going back to school. I don't want to go, Lord. Okay. Good. I ain't going to tell. I'm just going to give him a worksheet. I'm not going to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. But then there's this word. It's in my heart. And you see, I'm just not that strong. You see, I'm just not powerful enough to hoard up God's word. I'm just not that powerful. I'm not. My bench press in the natural is just not that good. Oh, it may be good. You may think, oh, for a 55-year-old, he ain't bad. But I'm telling you, compared to God, it ain't very good. And it starts burning. And it's, whoo, glory to God. Hey, coach, what do you want to tell about? Let's talk about Jesus. No, you didn't just say that. Door just popped open. A door, Jay, that I used to have. Boom, I used to have to kick it open. Now they're popping open. We're in an hour. We're in a dark day and a dark hour to where the light is shining the brightest. Take heed. Listen. Too many people waiting for some secret disappearance. My Bible says it's not a secret that every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Everyone who's dead in eternity past will rise up and see the Christ when he returns. It's not going to be a secret. But even if you don't see that, unfortunately, I've been a part of many funerals in the school of teenagers that I had the opportunity to speak at. What makes you think, let's just go with your theory, with your rapture theory. What makes you think you're going to be alive? What makes you think that you'll be here tomorrow? What promise do you have? That's why Jesus says that today has enough problems of its own, has enough evil of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. Take care of today. And if we would just learn to take care of God's business today, if we would just check into the school of the burning bush, if we just check in by the Holy Spirit, if we just get up in the morning, and I don't care what you feel like because I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. And if I would just stand up and say, Lord, God, I I don't feel like praying, but you're God, and I know who you are, and you sacrificed yourself on a cross. And, Lord, God, you promised that if I would believe and ask for the Holy Ghost that you would give it to me, Lord. And I need direction. I need assignment. I need correction in my life. I need to know I can't move from this place lest you go with me. Isn't that what Moses said? I can't move from this place. Let 
I'm going to preach here in a minute. I'll get off on something. He says, submit to God, resist the devil. Let me say it again, resist the devil. Resist the devil. We can't spiritually resist the devil because we haven't submitted to God. We submitted to man in some areas. We submitted to the false prophet that tells you what you want to hear. But we haven't submitted to God. Let me tell you, and this just hit me. You want to clarify a false prophecy? It's a message that builds a better you, a message that's void of tribulation. It's pretty easy to discern. We don't want to discern it because I like his message better than mine. But the fact of the matter is you'll get nowhere. Well, you'll, you'll get somewhere. Let me correct that. But it won't be where you think it is. And he says, resist the devil. And I just sit there and think about the discipline of working out. I've been working out since seventh grade. Again, I'm 55 years old. And I don't miss workouts. Even when I'm injured, you can ask my wife, I still work out. Even when my shoulders don't work, even through shoulder reconstruction, even through all. My son says, I said, hey, can you help my bench? He said, Dad, you're jacked up. I can't help you. I mean, sometimes I'm benching like this. And I got all these sissies. Up in the school, I can't work out because I hurt my knee back when I was 13. Like, shut up. But you know what else I noticed? They have that same attitude as far as the Word of God is concerned. I said first the natural, then the spiritual. The same attitude of lazy, sluggard spirit. Same attitude. No, I don't feel like it, but there's great profit in it. No, I don't feel like walking by the donut box, but there's great profit in it. And occasionally, I'll fall in it, but I don't stay there long. So I ain't preaching to you perfection. I ain't preaching to you I'm better than you. I'm preaching that I might be better off. There's a big difference in what I'm saying. We need a spiritual bench press, and I'm going to tell you this, guys, get you real excited, all you people that work out. There, there's, there's no plateau there. There's no sticking point. You see, you could live to be 500 years old. You won't. But you could live to be 500 years old, and your bench will continue to increase if you'll walk with God. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. You'll continue to grow. The things, Jay, that I thought I knew just a few years ago, the things I thought I knew 10 years ago, I knew nothing. I knew something, but I knew nothing. It's like putting your finger in the ocean. I, was, I got wet. I'll never, until I see him face to face, if it's even important at that time, understand. I, I won't arrive until I'm there, but I'm swimming, and I'm bench pressing, and, and, I'm, and I'm moving towards it. And the opposite of that is, is not only a lack of bench press, is, is a blindness that comes upon men and a hardness of heart. And so I submit to God, I resist the devil, he flees from me. Ephesians 6.10 says, submit to God. Ephesians 6.12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We wrest it doesn't say we might wrestle against these forces. It says we do wrestle. And as a coach, I can tell you right now, we're in the middle of track season. We don't go just go compete. We train to compete. In football season, we don't just show up on Friday night. We train to compete and to win. What's wrong with the body of Christ? <laughs> the win is guaranteed, but what's not, what is up to you is the free will choice to engage in being coached by the Spirit of the living God, to show up to the workout, so to speak. You see, that part is not happening, and I know it's not happening. If it did, you would, you would go to Walmart, you'd go to the halls of our schools, you'd go to your workplaces, and you'd see people talking about Jesus. You'd hear prayers going at all times, but you don't. I think it was the survey that I shared with you guys several months ago that concerning a biblical worldview, concerning a biblical uh, wor worldview out of Christian men, 80% of self-proclaiming Christian men said they did not believe in a biblical worldview. 
I kind of got a little enlightened, this, and this is not mine. I read this to somebody else, and I'm not going to go into great detail about it. But he was talking about a pastor. He was saying that he asked his congregation if uh, kangaroos exclusively came from Australia or from the Middle East or somewhere else. Once again, 80% said exclusively they've always been in Australia. He said, so you don't believe in Noah's Ark? You see, we've been so indoctrinated by the world, but that's not even the problem. The problem is, is that we've entertained it. The problem is, is that out of 168 hours a week, we spend at this church, you might get an hour of preaching, but at most, you probably get 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, after all, we got to have everybody out by noon, right? And we certainly can't start before 11. Well, that'd be blasphemous. And if we start early, we need to get out before noon. What is this about? Listen, I I could go for a long time, but whenever time's up, I'll just be done. I'm just just speaking as I feel like God is putting on my heart. What is this really about? I'm not, and I'm not telling you to take somebody else's what they're called to do and do exactly what they do. I've got a different. Listen, I've been fighting God for my whole Christian career, if you will. I've tried to do things that other people did, and, and, and I want to do some things that other people do, and this and that. But, but let's just get real about this. God spoke to me years ago. He says, where did I call you to be? Well, you called me to be in the school. He said, okay. So whatever else you do outside of there, that's on you. Nothing wrong with it. Not mad at you. Might even be some lives touched. But what did I call you to do? Well, you called me to go to school. And, and we're seeing that. I'm seeing in a school, I mean, 60 or 70 kids coming after school on a Friday to Bible study and not just sitting and listening, some of them participating. I'm seeing in a classroom, here I am thinking, man, it's time to retire, and I'm sitting there thinking, I go to school all day and do this. And I somebody say, hey, brother, uh, aren't you ever going to come to my church on Wednesday night? And say, brother, I am the church. And I don't mean that arrogantly. Don't take what I just said. We, we are the church. And I don't wait until somebody says, oh, you won't invite you to my meeting to find out if you're Christian or not. No, I find out by watching you when you're not at the gathering. I find out by what you do, what you talk to your coworkers about. I find out by when you go to school, who's your daddy? Is it the board that says you can't or is it the God that says you better? I'll find out. Because, see, I've got this crazy theology. It, I just got a feeling, Lane, that here's what happens. If, if they ever told me, if they had the power, because, see, all things, God controls all things, right? He's sovereign. That if they did tell me to go on, God just told me to go somewhere else. I just kind of see it a little bit different. I just lost my job. I can't preach the gospel. Can't. This is what I hear. I'm a Christian, too. Really? Well, what does that mean? I asked a, a little funny story. I'm going to tell you this. And I saw a kid and, uh, at, a, at a different school. And I said, you love Jesus, man? He said, yes, sir, I love Jesus. I said, tell me something about him. He goes, well, I also noticed he was hanging out with his girlfriend. And I know he's hugging on her and all that. And I think I probably heard him say, I love you, love you too, like that. I said, Okay. I said, he comes over. I said, you love her? He said, yes, sir. I said, give me three reasons why. He goes, she pretty. <laughs> and she goes, she's sitting there like, because two ain't coming. Nothing's coming out. He's going like, she's going like, that's it? And so we kind of parted ways. A little while later, come over and grab me and said, do you understand what I just did? What my point was, we were busy, we're working. I guess I could have used the philosophy, this is not the place, I'm busy, I don't have time for the ministry here. You know, you know, like nine out of ten do. And I said, hey, you know what I was doing? He said, no, sir. I said, if you love somebody, you ought to be quick. I said, if you ask me about my wife, I could, I could tell you three things pretty quick. Because we're in an intimate relationship, I, I know some things about her, some things that, you know, I, I like about her. That's because we drew us together. I mean, I could tell you some things. 
How, what kind of love is that? And you don't know nothing about them. I said, even this carnal love, which you really lust in many cases, I'm not saying their case, but in most cases, y'all know it is. Through high school kids, the hormones start whatever they do, you know. Used to be one of those, but I died. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to die too while well, y'all acting like y'all know. I don't even remember. I just thought it sounded good there. You ought to have, if, if, if we can't even know, first the natural, then the spiritual. I keep hearing that, First, First Corinthians 15, 46. And I know you think that's a little bit out of context, but for this lesson, it's not. If you don't even know how to have a relationship with your spouse or your children or whatever, if you don't know how to do that in the natural right here that you can see as children should be obedient to their parents as unto the Lord that it may go well with them, that they may live long upon them. If you can't do that here, that's a pretty good indicator you're not doing that with your Heavenly Father. Because here's what I know, okay? And we've all fouled some things up, I'm sure. I'm sure probably me more than most, okay? But if you're doing that with the Father, here's what I can guarantee you. He's going to convict you and correct you. Now, I don't know what you're doing with that conviction and correction because after a period of time, that will, you'll become hardened. But he is correcting you. He is correcting you if that's the case. If you're neglecting your job in those earthly relationships that he's given you that you can see that are here and now, then either you're under great conviction or you really just don't have a heavenly father relationship at all. You need to get saved today. Well, you're crazy, coach. Well, maybe compared to the world theology that you may be listening to, you're absolutely right. What is it, John 16, 8, that says that the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of what? Of sin, of righteousness and judgment. You're telling me that he is so weak and you're so powerful that you just hoard him up and hold him back. You do nothing. You can't hear anything. That's a lie. You're deceived. Get saved. Now, I'm going to tell you how big of a knucklehead I was and how consistent God was with me for over 20 years. He was convicting me. So I understand that side too. I was doing some stupid things, but I was under heavy conviction. And I thank God every day that he didn't go ahead and give me up according to Scripture he could have. And if you're sitting here listening right now, he hasn't given you up either. Amen? Amen. So let's move on a little bit. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this, and I was reading this. I'll, I'll back up just for a second to verse 3, and then I'll read uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to, those, veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, again, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe. I remember asking the Lord that question years ago, and I said, how can they help it if they're blind? He said, believing is a choice. You may not be where someone else is in their walk. You might be in kindergarten. You might still need milk. Maybe you're brand new at this. Maybe you just repented and got saved. I get it. That's why he says, make disciples of all nations. Grow them up so they can make disciples of all nations. But believing is a choice. According to Romans 12, 3, God has given to every man the measure. Now, some, some of your translations will say a measure, and people will take that, pervert it, twist it to however they want to fit it, and they'll say, well, I, brother, I just don't have the faith you have. No, you don't show up to work out. I, I just don't have the bench press you have. No, you're lazy. You see, I deal with this with football players, by the way. I know you wouldn't guess that, but not all of them are sold out or committed. Some of them have great potential. I have kids that have greater potential in some cases than the ones under the lights on Friday night, but because they won't show up, God can't use them. And, I, and I'm not talking about football here. <laughs> now, God has a wonderful plan for your life, and he's going, I'm sorry, I'm just... He's got a wonderful plan for your life. Repent. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Repent. Put your trust in Jesus. Follow him. Pray. Spend time with him. Well, I want to be a prophet. I want to be. <laughs> That's what you are. 
That's what you are. Isn't that good enough? Isn't that good enough? If God wants to call you something, let him call you something. You quit finding somebody else who will agree with your flesh. Blindness, hardness of heart. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Some of y'all getting it, some of you ain't. Blindness is a choice. It's true that it may only be a seed. A seed in your hand is no good, but a seed in the ground can produce a harvest. And even that seed, God's Word is a seed. He has given it to you. He's given you the ability because in Romans 1, somewhere in Romans 1, it says that, that they refused to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them up to a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate mind is? I want to make it simple because I'm a simple guy and I'm not the, uh, one of those theologians or anything like that. It is a carnal mind. It is the kind of person that may say please and thank you and hold the door, be polite to you, not cuss you. They might even buy your lunch, but they still live in a carnal mindset. They refuse to go deep into the things of God. They refuse to have an intimacy with God. They refuse to have a prayer life. They refuse to spend time in the Word, which is commanded, not suggested. They have a carnal mind. I'm not called. You know, sometimes people will tell me things like, Coach, you done lost your mind. I say, thank you, Jesus. And they're like, why are you laughing about that? Well, the Bible says, no, you're not, that you have the mind of Christ. And my mind was, said it, my mind was sending me to hell. I was condemned. I was born under a curse. I have the mind of Christ. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the wisdom of the Most High God. Not because I'm anything special, but because I surrendered to God. I accepted that, that, that seed of faith that he's given me. I cried out to a thrice holy God, and yet it wasn't even me. It was the drawing of the Holy Spirit because no man comes to God less drawn by the Spirit of God. You're sitting here because God has drawn you here now. Our world is in chaos. It's upside down. We have people that, listen, Love the sinner, hate the sin. I'm trying to be nice. Um, I don't want to see anybody go to that terrible place. I don't want to see anybody suffer the wrath of God. I don't want to see anybody go to where I deserve to go. But it's those kind of little weak messages that Kevin talks about all the time that well, I've got this God-shaped hole in my heart. No, what you need is God to punch you in the chest, rip your heart out, and stomp it in the floor is what you need. To where you, when you're gasping for breath, that he, and you cry out, then the heart of God, the Spirit of God moves in. That's what we need. That's what we need. I, I truly believe, and I've said this many times, that when Moses came down and he had the Ten Commandments etched in stone and he smashed them on the ground, I really believe that's what happens to the stony heart of man that comes in contact with the Word of God. I believe that. I, it just, I was reading that years ago and it just hit me. It said, yeah, that's what I did for you. Praise God. Blindness and hardness of the heart. Look here with me to Genesis. I'm going to give you a few, and I can't promise you I'll go fast. Oh, yeah, we're good. Genesis 3, and in verse 5. Blindness, hardness of heart, all of this stuff goes together. Refusal. The only reason you would refuse to go to work out because you don't see the benefit in it. The only reason you refuse to pray and seek the face of God because you don't see the benefit in it. You're blind. Hard-hearted. So Satan says to Eve, he says, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, y'all know this, but it, it's not, it doesn't say it's an apple tree, but y'all know why that's there the bite out of the fruit on the back of apple. And if you don't, get saved today. These messages are all over the world. We're headed to one world government, one world religion. 
We're headed to one world currency. And we have been eternally. God has prophesied it. It's going to happen. It's on everything. These messages are on everything. And my people, according to Hosea 4, 6, they perish and die because they refuse knowledge. They refuse it, which comes from the Spirit of God because they, they refuse to spend time with God. He knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. I asked my kids this in class. I said, do you think Adam and Eve were blind when they were perfect and sinless? They were like, it's kind of some of the looks I get. Well, if they were perfect and sinless, there's no disease, no sickness, coach. How could they be blind? He said that their eyes would be open when they opened the tree. Open to what? What it's open to now, sin. Open. And when I see open to sin, open to sin. I'm open to sin. What are we doing tonight, bro? We're open to sin. And the eyes of the Spirit were shut. You see, because I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. They were shut. In the second Adam, Yeshua came that we might be born again, that we may see. But unfortunately, many are claiming to be born again that are still blind. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Y'all turn with me again. Let's go to the book of Judges. And I alluded to this earlier in chapter 16. Uh, and let's just start. We know the story of Delilah. We know the story of Samson Delilah. Let's just go down there. And it says, and let's go to verse 19. She lulled him to sleep um, on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep, and he said, I will go out as before at other times, shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. You see, <laughs> sleeping is not symbolic necessarily of sleeping. It's symbolic of staying away from the, that intimacy with God, of seeking God that we talk about. And we've got many in the body, body of Christ who are sleeping. You can't deny that Samson was anointed. And there's people out there that will give you statements like this. Well, brother, no one can pluck you out of God's hand. No, they can't. But last time I checked, God gives you a free will to walk. And you can either walk to him or walk away from him. Last time I checked, Yeshua said to many people, follow me. Some of them came up with excuses. But my, my dad is dead. You know, I'm going to go to a funeral, whatever. Well, that's it. And God expects you to honor your mother and father. But that tells me there was something deeper in the equation. There's something going on in this man more than just honoring his dad. Probably he was the firstborn, which meant he got a double inheritance, which means he probably had money on his mind. Hmm. Sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Mm, my family built this business, man, from scratch, dude. We're very prosperous. I'll catch you next time you come around. We're entertaining things we ought not be entertaining. The conversations that, that, that I get to have with people all day, if you don't think there's a God, you need to come listen in. You go like, they talked about that at school. Yeah. Easter eggs. Rabbits, everything that we can do to distract from the Savior. Fat guy with a long white beard, not talking about you, Jay. Actually, I did one of those deals on mine, one of those the face app deal. That's, that's what I look like, Santa Claus. <laughs> everything we can do to distract from what's most important. And we come up with things like this that, oh, that's cruel. The kids ought to get to play that. You know what's cruel? Sending them to hell. You know what's cruel is dis disobeying your heavenly father. And you're sending souls to hell that God has trusted you to raise up in the ways of God. Oh, I, I, Kevin said it. I live it. I'm in the school. You want to see a withdrawal? Take a phone from a kid. You see demons. You'll see contorting. You'll see, ah, 
people flopping on the floor, rolling around. You see all manner of stuff. You say you don't believe in devils? Take some phones away. Because they're blind. They can't do anything without looking at their phone. Multiple times in classes, hallways, put your phone up, put your phone up, put your phone up, put your phone up, put your phone up. And then we're so stupid and contradictory that we say that we need technology for education. Devil knows what he's doing. It's been authorized by God to find out who the faithful were. So he's blinded. And when he's blinded in the natural, remember he's grinding. And when he's grinding, guess what happens? His hair begins to grow back and he finally begins to see. And this time, when he's taken into the temple to be made fun of, of the Philistines, there was more people that died at his hands for the anointing of God that came upon him than all of the times when he had his carnal eyesight. You see, sometimes we need to be blind. And I remember that there was a, there was a particular man years ago when this ministry first began. And I can't remember the guy's name. And Kevin used to pick him up. I met him a couple of times. And he was in a wheelchair, and he couldn't see anything. I don't think he even had eyes. And Kevin was talking about we need to pray for this guy that he would receive his sight. And I remember, I wasn't there that day, but I remember parts of the message. And Kevin was saying he was going to pray for him. And the guy said, hold on, wait. He said, I see better than you do. He knew something. We didn't comprehend that 20 years ago. I see better than you do. Sometimes it's a blessing that you can't see this. Can we go a little further? We got a few more minutes. It, raise your hand if I can get a few more minutes. It's three, six, nine, twelve, thirteen, twelve. We got a couple of hours left in here. Praise God! All right. <laughs> when you go to the the book of Exodus seven, and you might just jot these chapters down, and if this is important to you, because I'm going fast because there's just too much to cover. And it's the plagues that were, the thought that came across my mind was the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. And in, I guess it's in verse, I'm in chapter 7. Let's see if I can find where I was at. I'm sorry, go to verse, uh, or go to chapter 8 and verse 32. And this kind of stood out to me because we know the Scripture, and this is an age-old topic that we talk about, how that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And we come up with things like this, and, and it may be correct, it may not. And, I, and I'm willing to say at this time I walked in, I just don't know everything, okay? But God knows who's going to be faithful to him and who's not. And I, and I don't know why some people get more time than others, but who am I to question God? He knows the end result anyway. Why did he give me 20-some-odd years to repent, and somebody else may not have 20 days? I don't know. Why did I get some? But here's what I do know, and here's what you know. He did give you that opportunity, and you're sitting here today. And so be thankful for what you've been blessed with and what you've been given. But it says right here, and this stood out to me, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. It says in verse 32 and 832, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time. Also, and neither would he let the people go. And so I believe that this was what the third plague, maybe the fourth, the fourth plague. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Remember what I told you in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that blindness is a choice. Believing is a choice. Here, Pharaoh decided that he would harden his own heart. Okay? And as you move on, and you go on to ver- or chapter 9, In verse 12, it says, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So there's a time when you continue to be, let me just point this down, what I'm trying to get to, and you can read through that, that you need to understand that through your disobedience, that eventually your heart's going to get hard. You're going to become blind. Some of you have been hearing this message forever. And again, I don't know why God gave me 20 years. I, he's good. But listen, I'm, sometimes I'm cautious, Lane, to even talk to my class about that. I probably did when you was in my class. How many years has that been? Three, four years when you were in that leadership class? And I'm cautious to give my testimony the years and all that because sometimes I know how it is 
when I was a teenager, I might go, oh, he gave Coach Shelby 20 years. Shoot, I just heard about it today. I got plenty of time. That's what concerns me. Because, see, none of those people who've died in our school or in Wise County probably thought that that was it for them. Probably none of them uh, thought that, 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 that they wouldn't make it to my age. And that's the danger with that kind of thought process. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the Lord has given you. You have a responsibility today to do something with it. And let's turn lastly to one other place, and I will be done with you, I think. Unless the Lord says no. Turn with me to the book of John in chapter 9. And in John chapter 9, Okay, this was the man that was born blind. You remember, I'm going to paraphrase this, that, that chapter, so I don't have to read it all to you. And again, that's your assignment, John chapter 9. All right, he was born blind. Remember, Jesus made mud pies, put them in his eyes. He had to go wash off, and he began to see. Okay, I don't know why he made mud pies. I don't know why he spit in the mud and put it in his eyes. I mean, all he had to do was just say, behold. I suspect that sometimes God does things so that because we get so religious in the way that we do things, we think that what God told us to do yesterday is going to tell us to do it exactly the same way tomorrow, so we quit seeking God. So he throws us a curveball to see if we're still listening. It's just like the lady Joe in the church I ministered at when I was in Sanger, and she had an ear infection. And I knew that I heard God say, tell her to go stick her finger in the water faucet and put it in her ear. And I'm like, I am not saying that. I'm sitting there at church, and we're like, I'm not doing that. Joe suffered for another two or three weeks because I wasn't telling her that. I'm going to look like, you're talking about a false prophet or whatever. I mean, false whatever. Wicked sheep. I don't know what it was. I know I heard it. And I'm sitting there preaching on Wednesday night, and the Lord slipped in on me. Like when he kind of caught me off guard, and I just spoke it out of my mouth. I said, oh! Ooh, Holy Ghost, I played it off a little bit, like, ah, I just said it. She had a walker, and she was sitting like right there, and she took off. She bolted like Bigfoot. She was going down the aisle. And I'm like, hold on, Jesus, got to get this surface over with she gets out of there. Because if she comes out and it didn't work, it look real bad. I have to bless you. Hey, good night. Praise God. Father, thank you. Y'all get out of here. Before I could get all that done, Joe goes, it worked. Like she was back there, and like heard a voice coming out, and I'm like, my heart was like going boom, 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 like that. She said, it worked. It worked. She's coming down the aisle. She said, Coach, she was in excruciating pain for weeks. I don't know what the ear infection was. The doctors couldn't help her. She kept going back. Now this was happening. And I'm going like, that's about as crazy thing I've ever heard in my life. Jesus. <clears throat> I got something for you, bro. Let me cram this in your eye. Not that he could see him coming, but at the same time, Think about that for a minute. Now, weirdos, don't be a weirdo. Don't go out there and try to create, you know, these kind of things. This is something God's got to speak to you, and the evidence will be you'll be going like, no. Because there are weirdos out there. You know, like, they just start coming up with weird things to do. And they call it, no, 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 I wasn't coming up. I was trying to get out of it, Okay. So this guy receives his eyesight, and you know what happens when he begins to see? Y- y'all know what they did, right? They kicked him out of the church. He got, he got excommunicated. They said, get out. You're not welcome here no more. They said, who healed you? I said, I don't know. Somebody named Jesus. I don't. Do you bl- All I know is I was blind, now I see. He threw some mud in my eyeball. I washed it out, and I see. They said, you ain't welcome here no more. I'm going to tell you something right now. And this is all I'm going to do, this chapter. And if you start seeing in the Spirit, you start seeing things, I am telling you, don't be shocked. You won't be welcome anymore. Your phone won't ring. You're not going to get messages. If you got a message from somebody else, you ain't going to get many likes, <laughs> if any. It's not going to happen. Jesus is sitting there, and he's got a whole room full of people. He says, hey, eat my body, drink my blood. Damn, we're out of here, bro. There's 12 folks sitting over there. It's just this section right here. That's it. All the rest of y'all done gone. 
He goes, y'all want to go too? He didn't say, now come on, guys. Hey, hey, hey. Stop it. He said, get. Peter said, no, Lord, you got the words of life. No. And see, it's even like the woman with the issue of blood. Now, if I can get a hold of him, I'm going to get a hold of him. See, people won't even get up 10 minutes in the morning. 10 minutes in the morning, just go sit and stop worrying about I don't feel like it. You don't feel like going to work every day, but you go. I know I don't feel like going every day, but I go. And when I get there, I'm glad I did. Because that's when these kind of conversations take place. Did we do this every day? And I'm telling you, and then I feel bad. It's kind of like a, a repetitive cycle. I go and say, oh, Lord, I just I don't want to go to school today. And I get there, and the Holy Ghost start moving. Kids start talking about the Word. I'm talking about the Word. Going on, and then I, by the afternoon, I'm going, Lord, I repent. God, forgive me, Lord. And then I go to bed, and I get up the next morning. I don't want to go to school today. <laughs> say, Lord, I'm giving you something real. I'm giving you something real. And so they kicked him out of the church. <laughs> In verse 39, I believe is where I'm at. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world that those who do not see may see and that that those who see may be made blind. You know he's talking to, right? The church, right? And some of them claiming to see, got their scriptures all down, they, they got their little routines and all this, but they're being made blind and he's talking about spiritually, they're already blind, or he wouldn't probably be saying what he's saying in the first place. Jesus came to open the prison doors. He came to give sight to the blind. Let me make it plain for those of you that are struggling. He came that you would be born again and saved, that you would repent. He came that his spirit would be downloaded, move inside of you. And when he comes inside of you, he is a God of war, Exodus 15, 3. He comes to declare war against you. That's called conviction, John 16, 8. He comes to declare war. He comes just like he did in Genesis 32 when he, when he wrestled with Jacob, and he wrestled. And here's the cool thing about Jesus is Jacob held on to him, and he said, let me go. And Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go till I'm, till I'm done. I won't let you go until you reside in me. I won't let you go until I'm born again and saved. I won't let you go until I know what your purpose for me is. God. I won't let you go. God, do you think he couldn't get away? You see, God doesn't want to get away. The point is, is that he will let you struggle so that you will die to yourself so that you can truly see. And the limp that he walked with was a lean on God the rest of his life. He feared his brother who was a carnal man. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. You know, those of you that are out there preaching this message, God loves everybody. He's madly in love with you. Even if you go to hell, he's still going to love you and just weep buckets of tears over you. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I hated. And you know the part of this is, these were twin brothers. You have both. (laughs) You have both. Esau is your sin nature. And God says, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it when you try to do things that appear good to men who are easily deceived, but there's no leadership for me in it at all. There's no calling for me in it at all, and I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's even good deeds. Your good deeds are a stench in the nostrils of God. What is not led by God, and that's why I told you what I told you a while ago. I can try to do everything else the world does, or I can do what God called me to do. And what he called me to do is to go into that school. Stop trying. Get your direction from God. I feel like I need to read the rest of that, but I'm not sure if I do or not. I may be done. Some of the Pharisees, in verse 40, were with him, heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore 
your sin remains. Jesus is a master at the way he puts words together. <laughs> you know, uh, it, you know I, I could go on and on and on about the things that Jesus says, but if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, just remember this. Disobedience breeds hardness of heart. It breeds blindness, brings blindness upon you, and eventually eternal separation from God, the wrath of God that Jesus suffered on the cross for. And let me remind you this too. If you're truly born again, if you're truly saved, you might screw up, mess up, whatever you want to call it. But I can assure you it's like somebody digging in your chest with a, with a butter knife. It's called conviction. And if that conviction's not there, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm saying this out of love because somebody has lied to you and deceived you. Somebody probably in the church that said when you came to the altar at 8 and you said this prayer after me, you got born again. But there's never been a conviction or a desire to serve God since. You were just happy that you got that on the checklist. You were just happy that, oh, well, now when I go to your funeral that I can lie to everybody. I had a guy when I was in high school, as wicked as they come, which tells you a little bit about me. We played beside each other in football, won a state championship together in football, and he died of a heart attack at 27. This was many years ago. I went to his funeral. I wasn't serving the Lord at that time. But even in these things, I mean, I still had an understanding. There was still someone in me. There was still someone drawing me. And I knew what truth was, even though I might not be able to tell you where the Scripture was. And the preacher got up there and just made a big deal out of this man was in heaven because he came to the altar when he was eight years old and he repented and all that. This guy, we used to spend the night at his house. You know how kids are, right? You used to be one. Okay, I'm just checking. Because he would sleepwalk. When he'd sleepwalk, he, he thought he was Satan. His eyes would literally roll back in the back of his head. Now, we were a bunch of dummies, apparently. This just was entertainment for us. And so we go to his house, and his eyes, you can like, like, this ain't fake. How you do that? I can't do it. They, there was no, there's no, like, they, they rolled back. He was possessed. There's no doubt about it. And we would sit there and mock and make fun of him and say, yeah, you're the devil. Whatever, bro. You know, just talk smack to him. He'd be like, oh, I want to kill every stinking one of y'all. As soon as y'all go to bed, he would just start going off. And we'd go like, yeah, bro, whatever. You know. He went there and got a butcher knife out of, his, out of the kitchen drawer. His grandparents were probably in their 70s then, if I remember correctly. And it was one of the nights we didn't come over for the entertainment. And he chased them around the house with a butcher knife in the middle of the night. And fortunately... Because he was, you know, 27. They're in their 70s. They didn't get around them so well. Fortunately, they locked themselves in their bedroom until someone came over. I think they had to call the police. This guy drops dead of a, or dies of a heart attack at 27 years old. This guy was sexually immoral. He said he was Satan. Never, ever, in all the years we played football or anything, ever darkened the door or come into a church house or anything. Not that that makes you saved. Because it don't. Like I say, never talked about the Lord, never any conversation about it. Corrupt, even uh, incest involved, just leave it at that. Sexual immorality, sexual immorality, but any way you want to look at it. Wicked, vile. When we got people that are out teaching people that as long as you come up here and say this prayer to me, God's faithful, you have to go to heaven. With absolutely no evidence. I'm, I'm telling you this, and I've heard this before. If you were taken to court today, and there's somebody that had been following you around for this last week, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a follower of, of Yeshua, of being a Christian? I'm just going to ask you that. I don't want you to answer it. How many excuses do you have why you don't share Jesus with your family and at your workplace? Good. You're sure pleasing Satan. And if you're not sharing him, let me go back to what I said again. Is it ripping your, is it, is it, my God, Lord. Because I do believe if you're saved, I do believe you can be disobedient, but I do believe it will rip at your heart. And eventually you're going to say, I can't take it anymore. You ever played that punch game before? Somebody punches you in the same spot over and over? Pretty soon you say, I can't take it anymore. Okay, God, I'm going to tell them about you. It's whack, whack, whack. Just do that about 46 times. Pretty soon you'll say, you can go tell them about Jesus, I'm going to keep punching you. Uh, Y'all know Jesus. <laughs> Y'all know Jesus. <laughs> That's how it feels. 
That's how it feels when I go out into the world. That, that's how I, I'm sitting there going, Lord, open the door. I, I'm not going to go kiss everybody. I told you everybody's baby, hug everybody. Say, but, but God, I'm available. I don't have guys, that, people that will come up to me and say, hey, coach, what are your training techniques? Glad you asked. <laughs> Spirit, soul, body. In that order. Does that make sense to anybody? I just spoke what God put on my heart, and I pray that you'll take it and run with it. Listen, the hour is dark. It's dark out. There's a, there's a demonic, um, and it's being allowed. Some people would say it's even planned. There's a, there's a takeover. You know, Satan is after our children, but in order to get the children, it means he already has the parents. I don't believe that you can come in and take one of my grandkids. I just don't believe you can. So in order to get the kids, that means that mom and dad, something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I'm talking about a prayer time and intimacy. The, the most humbling thing I ever experienced is when I became powerless. When I became powerless, when I could not, <laughs> I always felt like I had the ability to make people do what they didn't want to do. When I lost that, that is the most frustrating, freeing, humbling. I don't even know how many words that kind of contradict each other to mix with that. That when a child grows up and you can't go wring their neck, you can't just bring them home, handcuff them, and lock them in the room. They're grown now. A loved one, an aunt, uncle, whatever the case may be. But see, that's when it really proves your trust in God. So, Father God, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the sound of my voice. And God, I don't speak of carnal power here. I don't speak of carnal bench pressing. I don't speak, Lord God. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. But God, even a whisper in your name that comes from the heart of God is enough to crush and move mountains, Lord. That, Father God, that the kingdom of darkness would flee where you send your sons and daughters because the power of God, because of your presence that's released in that place. Then, Lord God, that there would be hearts broken today, that there would be heart surgeries, there would be heart transplants, that hearts of stone would be ripped out of chest today, stomped in the ground, destroyed by the Word of God. That, Lord God, they may receive eternal life, that they may receive the Spirit of the living God. That, God, there would be evidence because you said in Matthew 7 that a tree was known by its fruit. You said, as my brother Rick said, that, that you are the vine and we are the branches. That we would be plugged into you, Lord God, and we would bear much fruit, Lord. That we would yield ourselves and lay ourselves on the altar of God as a living sacrifice. Here we are, Lord. Prune us. Direct us. Correct us. Chasten us, God. Sift us, as my brother Jay says. Shake us, oh God. That there'd be nothing left except that which you've given, Lord. That, Lord God, we would be a water hose, oh God, plugged into the spigot of heaven, Lord God. And that the direction would be pointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. That your spirit would fall upon these people, Lord God. That, Lord God, that today they would never be the same. That, God, that you would ignite a prayer life in them, Lord. That, Lord God, their lamps would be full of the oil, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, God. That they would burn, Lord God. That they would spill, that their cup wouldn't be halfway filled, but it would be running over. That everybody they come in contact with, Lord God, would get saturated. That we would never be the same, God. God, we failed you, Lord. We failed you as a people. We failed you as a nation. Our fathers failed you, Lord God. And God, we ask you that we would be humble, Lord God, that we would repent, and that we would lift our voices to heaven, and that, God, I'm praying that one more time in this nation, that one more time that you'd give us one more reprieve, God, that one more time, Lord God, for the sake of our children and our children's children, God, that you would give us one more opportunity, Lord God, Lord God, to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel, the true word of God, 
that the perversion, Lord God, that the harlotry would be taken out of it, Lord God, because it would be preached from the heart of God and not the heart of men. That, Lord God, those who refuse this directive, I'm asking, first of all, that there be a great repentance in the body out of pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists, those that call themselves prophets, that there would be a great repentance, O oh God. But God, if there's not be a repentance, O oh God, that there'd be a great exposure. We don't ask, Lord God, then to be punished. I ask them to be saved and to repent, Lord. And I ask that the remnant, Lord God, of people in this body, in this church, that are online, in this congregation, that, Lord God, when we go home and we rise up in the mornings, that names of those that you've given us are put on our hearts and we speak out of our mouths. I don't pray for the world, Jesus said in John 17, but for those you have given me. Who has God given you? And if you don't know, God, I'm, I'm asking that, Lord God, that they humble themselves till they know and that we begin to pray for those you've given us. Spirit of God, pour upon us. Spirit of God, help me to stop looking forward to something different than what you called me to today. Help me, Lord God, to proclaim the gospel that the next generation, Lord God, that you've put us in contact with, that they shall be saved. For the word of God is greater than the powers of darkness. One word from Yeshua destroys all strongholds of Satan. That prison doors be opened, that blind eyes see, that hearts be replaced, and that they never be the same. God Almighty, you are God. And as you told Solomon, if we would follow your statutes, if we'd follow your ways, that your hand would be upon us, and we'd prosper in the things of God that you called us to. God, remind us of our past victories that you've brought us through. There's so many people in this church that are listening online that have been set free. They've been set free from addictions, drugs, alcohol. Some of them have been set free from family members who hate you. I know it wasn't your intent in the beginning, Lord. Some of them have been set free from bondages, from unions from unholy and ungodly marriages. We don't promote that. We know that's not. But God, you have. You've set some people free. You've given us another opportunity that we don't deserve. Let us proclaim to the nations, God. Let us proclaim to the world. Let us see marriages restored. Let us see children come home. Let us see workplaces break out. And I'm not big on the word revival, but some people need to be revived because they never have. They need to be revived. They need to be born again. They need to be saved. And God, I'm asking that every word, Lord, that was spoken here is engrafted, is planted deep in the soul of men and women in the sound of my voice. That today will never be the same. Will never be the same. God, forgive us. We plead the blood of the Lamb. We plead the blood of the Lamb. What is your testimony? What is your... I plead the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. That I'm willing to be a witness even unto death to the Lord. The Lord God, that we would be martyrs if that's what it took. As the men of old, Lord, gave their lives, O oh God, for you, Lord God. That there would be a generation that would rise up, that would give their lives unto you, Lord. Father God, I pray these things. I believe these things. And I say them in the name of Yeshua. Somebody said amen. Praise God, guys.